Thank you for this time, Lord. To you be the glory. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Is the world a safe place? Ask yourself that for a minute. Is the world a safe place? It seems like a relevant question to me, doesn't it? Especially in the middle of a, a global pandemic. Many people today might answer no for that very reason. But others might answer no. No, the world is not a safe place because they are clearly in dangerous situations. Maybe you find yourself in a dangerous situation this morning. I think of maybe a soldier in a volatile region of the world, a woman in an abusive relationship, an elderly man living in a gang-infested part of town. But I'm, I'm guessing that most people who fundamentally believe the world is not a safe place, that most people are people not currently in danger, but who have been in the past, maybe repeatedly. And when we talk about danger, we don't have to imagine criminals or crocodiles or a crate of explosives going off. Sometimes the danger, sometimes the danger in question is a hurtful relationship. Sometimes people don't believe the world is a safe place simply because they have been hurt. They've suffered blows, one circumstantial blow followed by an emotional blow, one after the other. How about you? Do you believe the world is a safe place? Maybe it's better to ask, do you live each day like the world is a safe place. To some extent, in light of our individual experiences, all of us believe the world is unsafe in some way. Therefore, we avoid certain people. We avoid certain places. We avoid certain circumstances or conversations maybe certain behaviors, certain thoughts. Maybe we avoid hopes and dreams because they feel unsafe, because we have been hurt, because we have been disappointed, because we have been rejected. Therefore, inwardly, we label, oftentimes, we label such things as unsafe. For some, feeling unsafe is generally circumstantial, uh, a once-in-a-while kind of struggle. For others, it is absolutely crippling. For still others, not feeling safe is, in fact, the undiagnosed driver of this or that healthy, sorry, unhealthy behavior in their life. What am I getting at with all of this? Well, it's this. Not feeling safe is a very real and a very common struggle. One with which we have to grapple. And wonderfully, it is also a struggle to which God speaks. It's a struggle about which God cares. That's good news this morning. Let's unpack that and look deeper into this by turning to Psalm 115 this morning. Psalm 115. If you have a Bible open to the Psalms, they are right dead center in the Bible. If you just flip the Bible open in the middle, you're going to see the book of Psalms. We're looking at Psalm 115. If you have a Bible app or a Bible open in your browser, uh, navigate over to Psalm 115, if you would. This morning, we're going to dig into uh, the first of three studies in the coming weeks. Three studies focused on that key word, safe. You see it right there, safe. Let me begin by simply reading through this psalm. And as I do that, think about how it connects 
to our initial questions, our initial thoughts about feeling safe. Listen as God speaks to us through this ancient writer. This psalm is probably close to 3,000 years old. So hear it in an English translation. Listen to what God still says to us through his, his word. Not to us, O Lord. And that capital L-O-R-D in your Bibles is a translation of the divine name Yahweh. Yahweh was the name of the God of Israel. It wasn't just a name, it was a name that meant the self-existing one, the eternal one, the one who is and always is. So Yahweh is a more personal name. We have it translated as Lord in our Bibles. There's some reasoning behind that. I don't like the reasoning, but so I'll translate it as Yahweh when I see it, L-O-R-D, capital letters. Not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name, Give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O Israel, Trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. You who fear Yahweh, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. Yahweh has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Yahweh, both the small and the great. May Yahweh give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by Yahweh who made heaven and earth. The heavens are Yahweh's heavens but the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise Yahweh, nor do any who go down into silence, but we, the living, we will bless Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore praise Yahweh. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So, this morning, we will not be going line by line and dealing with every idea that we find in this psalm. We just don't have time for that. But we are going to step back and consider several of the themes that we discover in this passage and how we're going to consider how they might speak to the ideas of being safe, of feeling safe. Notice, first of all, in talking about these themes, when you look back over that psalm, notice, first of all, there is danger on all sides. There is danger on all sides. This idea is not right on the surface. It's not explicit in this psalm. But if you look at verse 2 again of Psalm 115, you'll see it there. Why should the nation say, where is their God? What exactly does that mean? Are nations coming to them saying, hey, where's your God? We want to worship him. No, it's just the opposite of that. This is a reminder, verse 2, a reminder that ancient Israel was surrounded on every side, except the Mediterranean side, on every side by nations who sought to take advantage of any, of, any season of struggle in Israel. They sought to exploit any adverse circumstances 
in an attempt to assert their own supremacy. Whatever was happening in Israel when this psalm was composed two to 3,000 years ago, when this psalm was composed, feeling unsafe was a result of precisely this threat, this geopolitical threat, this military threat. This is why we go on to read how, number two, God is our help and our shield. You can't miss that refrain in verses 9 through 11. How could you? It's, it's stated three times. Anything that's stated three times in the Bible in this kind of tight, compact space is something you absolutely should give your attention to, that you should absolutely consider because it is an emphasis that you do not want to miss. It's stated three times here, first to the nation as a whole. Then it's uh, announced to the priests. That's the house of Aaron. They were the teachers in ancient Israel. And finally, it is, it is repeated a third time to each and every individual, to each God-fearing Israelite. He is their help and their shield. Now, if you know anything about the Psalms, then you know that help and shield are words that we find repeatedly used of God in the Psalms. So when we understand this geopolitical threat from the surrounding nations, this repeated refrain makes sense, doesn't it? Those who were fearful of their safety in light of the, the situation, this emphasis is so reassuring. He is their God is their help and their shield. Now, the refrain, this refrain is especially true since number three, their threats are ultimately empty. Their threats are ultimately empty. Did you notice that four verses... Four verses are spent on the foolishness of following idols. That's the carved statues of these false gods of these nations. Um, look at verses 4 through 8. Look at verses 4 through 8. Why so much ink spent on this topic? Well, we have to remember that Israel's pagan neighbors, that they made threats in the names of their particular gods. They believe their gods were stronger. And if they happened to win a battle against the Israelites, this would have proven to them the superiority of their deities over Israel's God. Thus, they might ask mockingly in verse 2, where is their God? Right? Where is their God? Here's our God. Here's our victory. Here's our power. Where is their God? So the psalmist desperately wants to remind his possibly desperate readers that these so-called gods are nothing more than dead idols. And their worshipers are like them, spiritually dead. But Israel serves the living God in wonderful contrast. Israel serves the living God. So in, in terms of ultimate things, the threats of these idol worshipers are as empty as the idols they worship. It's this contrast between the false gods and the true gods that points us to this final theme. Number four, God's power and pleasure serve his purpose. God's power and pleasure serve his purpose. Even before we read about the emptiness of the many so-called gods, starting in verse 4, look at verse 3 again. Verse 3 declares, in contrast to the emptiness of these so-called gods, it declares the fullness of the one true God. And what kind of fullness do we see there in verse 3? Look at it again. Really savor that verse. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Isn't that amazing? 
What an amazing statement. Now, let's be clear about what that statement is saying. That verse is not about two things, which we might think when we first read it. It's not about God's location and and somehow God's selfishness. He gets his way. He does whatever he pleases, right? No, it's not about two different things. It's not about those things. This verse is about one thing. It's about God's sovereignty. Sovereignty. What is a sovereign? A sovereign is a ruler, a king who has absolute power in his kingdom, a queen who has absolute power in her kingdom. Sovereignty is that power, royal power to reign over all things. That, that's precisely what this verse is about. It means that God is the exalted. He's in the heavens. He's the exalted king of the universe. And he rules over all things. And he rules in all things according to his good pleasure, to whatever pleases him. Even over our hard things, even over the scary things, even over the painful things, even over the confusing things, even over a world of false idols and angry threats and defeats and losses in battle. God reigns. God is supreme. God is in the heavens and he does all that pleases him. Our God reigns, brothers and sisters. And his infinite power and his holy pleasure serve his perfect purposes. Notice what this psalm tells us about the God who purposes. Verse 1. He is a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. Notice what this psalm tells us about this God's purposes. Verses 12 and 13. Yahweh has remembered us. He will bless us. Here come those three audiences again. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Yahweh, both the small and the great. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter which status, position you hold in society. It doesn't matter your past, color your skin, how you talk, your level of education. This is a promise of blessing from a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. In scary times, in unsettling times, ancient Israel could know that God's purposes were characterized by blessing. They were characterized by, verse 14, increase, increase. And these purposes were larger than their patch of land in the Middle East. Verse 16 The heavens are the Lord's. The heavens are Yahweh's heavens. But the earth, this world, he has given to the children of man. Isn't that encouraging to you? A God of infinite power who does what he pleases is not a God who is capricious. He is not a volatile God. He is not a God who does whatever he pleases like a spoiled child throwing a tantrum uh, like, a, like a, a, a jealous lover, trying to get revenge against the person who hurt her. That's not our God. The God who does what he pleases, pleases according to his infinite power is a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. He's a God of blessing, a God who has a purpose of blessing. Is this world a safe place? No. But ultimately, yes, for those who trust in the Lord, for those who trust in Yahweh, the God of Israel. Well, we have to ask, why no? Why did I say no at first? Well, there is danger. Let's go back. There is danger on all sides, right? There is danger on all sides. As Psalm 115 reminds us, we we see that every day there are dangerous circumstances and dangerous people and Risks that we take in this life, all sorts of areas. But in the face of that danger, we have incomparable comforts. God 
is our help and our shield. But what about those earthly dangers that we face, whether they be physical, relational, emotional, vocational, financial, etc.? Well, God wants us to know their threats are ultimately empty. Their threats are ultimately empty. They can't have ultimate power against us if God's ultimate power is for us. Amen? And as we just heard, God's power and pleasure serves his purpose. They serve his purpose. What is that purpose? That purpose is to bless. So how would these truths change us? How will these truths change us? How can we live in light of what God has revealed? How do we live today in light of what God revealed then? But this truth that God today is speaking to us by even his spirit through his word. It is interesting as a side note, isn't it? It is interesting that all of these other gods, these false idols, that not one of them is worshipped today. Do you know a church of Dagon? Do you know a, a temple to Baal in the Phoenix area or in the nation anywhere? How about Molech? None of these gods are worshipped. So why is the God of Israel still worshipped thousands of years later? This God, Yahweh. And we're going to talk about that. We know part of it is that he is the living God, the true God, and his power and his purposes are at, truly at work in this world. But we're asking that question, how does this change us? How do we live differently in light of what God has revealed? The Bible encourages us to be doers of the word, not simply those who hear. Don't simply hear it and say, that was nice, and then walk away and do nothing with what God has entrusted to you. So how do we do something with what God has entrusted to us this morning in Psalm 115. Well, let me share some thoughts. First, it's important to understand when and if possible, why you feel unsafe or less safe. Give that consideration, give attention to that. Sometimes that's not the kind of thing that we want to think about. It's something that we only want to re react to when we feel those kinds of feelings. Some of us know all too well when and why we feel unsafe. But for others, it may be important to identify the when and then maybe what's underneath that. What else is going on? Why do we feel unsafe around that person, in that circumstance, in this experience of our life when we think about such and such? Why do we feel unsafe. Still, other, others of us aren't thinking at all in terms of safety and danger, right? We don't think in those terms, some of us. What are the telltale signs that someone feels unsafe, even when they're not using that language? Defensiveness. Been defensive recently? Gotten defensive with somebody else? How about withdrawal? or wholesale retreat. Experience that recently wanted to run away from something or someone wanted just to get out. What about emotional paralysis? Have you experienced that recently where you just felt like you didn't know what to do next? You were just stuck. Those who study human behavior have described this as a fight flight or freeze response that's evident in, in all people. All of us have one of those kinds of responses in general that can also respond in all of those ways at different times. So could it be that your attitude of defensiveness, and I'm speaking to those who may not think of, about the ideas of safety and danger, that's not part of the vocabulary of feeling unsafe, but could it be that your attitude of defensiveness, that your tendency to withdraw, or your emotional or relational paralysis is not ultimately about what is happening on the outside, that is the circumstance, but ultimately instead is about you feeling unsafe 
on the inside. God did make you with a self-preservation system. It's part of his beautiful design of who you are, of who I am. It's a system that alerts you to danger and it helps you to avoid that danger. That's a good thing. The problem is sin has corrupted that system. And so now our perception of what is safe and unsafe and our response to it is often, ironically, harmful to us and maybe harmful to the people in our lives. Would you take time to pray today? Would you take time to pray this week about when and why you feel unsafe, why you react the way that you do? Or for some, would you take time to, 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 to simply to ask God to simply reveal how this is a factor in your life, evident through those kinds of emotional and behavioral symptoms? Number two, second, ask God to help you see the ultimate emptiness of worldly threats. Ask God to help you see the ultimate emptiness of worldly threats, like we talked about already in terms of these idols. Now, I don't say this in order to minimize the seriousness of the dangers you're facing or those feelings of danger and uh, of being unsafe that you're dealing with. I share this with you this morning in order to help you consider that seriousness in light of what we've called an ultimate perspective, an ultimate perspective. For example, if you feel unsafe because of COVID-19, then consider its threat. The worst, the worst thing COVID-19 can do to you is kill you, right? Now, some of you are thinking, yeah, yeah, that's the worst thing. Does it get any worse than that? It does. You see, if it's the worst thing that it can, if the worst thing it can do is kill you, then we need to think about God's ultimate perspective. And God teaches us through his word that your life is far bigger than your physical existence. He teaches us that our life is bigger than just the here and now that God is a God of eternity. He reminds us, even though we like to try to deny it, tell ourselves otherwise, he reminds us that your death is inevitable. Whether it be a virus or something else that takes you out, you're going out, friend, just like me. You are leaving this world, and God is good to remind us that our days are short, that our time is temporary. But he doesn't do this as a some kind of cosmic killjoy. No. God reminds us that in the face of something like death by virus, he reminds us that he offers us ultimate hope. Remember how beautifully it's put by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. We as sinners can expect that death. But the free gift of God is is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's not just duration of life. That is quality of life. That is life with God in the freedom that Christ has made possible forever and ever and ever and ever. You see, when we have that kind of perspective on our lives, it begins to put a, a different spin on death by virus, doesn't it? It begins to empty these threats that we face on a daily basis. And the same is true for every worldly threat that might threaten our safety in the here and now. So ask God for the eyes to see that emptiness in light of the full of his eternal purpose of blessing in Jesus Christ. Number three, a third idea application. Third, be specific as you rehearse your safety in light of God's sovereignty. Be specific as you rehearse your safety in light of God's sovereignty. 
When you feel overwhelmed by danger on all sides, or at least danger on one side, try to stop and think of that circumstance and those feelings in light of Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Remember why that's so relevant. God's position reminds us of God's power, which in turn points us to God's pleasure in accomplishing God's purposes. And God's purposes for his people are unstoppable purposes of blessing. Therefore, in the midst of that hard or that scary or that painful or that confusing time, when you feel unsafe, memorize, then meditate on Psalm 115, verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Remind yourself, God is over this, but he's also in this. God is over this, but he's also in this. When the psalmist reminds his readers three times that God is their help and their shield, he is not denying the reality of danger. He knows there's danger. No, he is encouraging them that in spite of that danger, they are protected for God's purposes of blessing. Can you believe that about your life? Can you say honestly, sincerely, he is my help and my shield. God is our help and our shield. God provides and protects and nothing and no one can change that because our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. You see, understanding God's sovereignty, even though it's a big $10 theological word, it's a beautiful word. It's a powerful word. It's a word that should be precious to you. And here's one of the reasons why. Understanding God's sovereignty is the key to understanding ultimate safety. You will never truly feel safe. Look what I have here. You will never feel truly safe in this world unless you can truly see the one who's over this world. Yes. Let, me, let me say it again. You will never feel truly safe in this world unless you can truly see the one who is over this world. And that scene, what I mean by scene, of course, is with eyes of faith. That is a process. It is not a one-time transaction. It can be a one-time transaction that happens very powerfully in your life, but it's still a process of turning our eyes repeatedly back because we get so distracted. Our eyes get so distracted. Our sight gets so clouded. The readers of Psalm 115, they knew the true God. But that didn't mean they didn't need to be once again reminded of the true God. That's why Psalm 115 is so precious as a reminder to all of us who know God. We all need these reminders regularly. Is this world a safe place? No. But ultimately, yes. For the one who trusts God. For the one who trusts him through Christ. We know that when we read past one Psalm 115, if we have the opportunity to sit here for the next few hours and just keep reading right through the Bible, we would eventually come to the New Testament. And we know that all the promises of the Old Testament find their fullness in the New Testament, specifically in the person of Jesus. Only Jesus can bring us to the, to the God who is described in Psalm 115. Only through Jesus and his incomparable life, his incomparable work, only through his death and resurrection can we know those ultimate purposes of blessing. Not just temporary, not just circumstantial, not just episodic blessings here and there, but ultimate forever purposes of blessing that God has made possible through his son, Jesus Christ. 
Is this world a safe place? Some today, and maybe some of you, when I first asked that question this morning, would say, yes, the world is generally a safe place. And I would generally agree with, and I would agree with you in some sense, we wouldn't be able to live our lives the way that we do if the world was generally not safe with only bits of <laughs> times of safety here and there. It's generally safe with times of, of unsafety and danger here and there. But many of you would have answered that initial question, yes, but you would have done so possibly, oftentimes, those who answer yes to that question do so because of their position, because of their network, their social network, maybe because of their money, maybe because of their health, maybe because of past successes, maybe because of, of, of smooth sailing in general for their life. Those are all good things. Those are all blessings. But brothers and sisters, friends, ultimate safety is not rooted in anything like that. It's not rooted in anything of this world. Your success, your story, your position, your whatever. Ultimate safety. The safety by which we say, yes, this world is a safe place. That safety is anchored in the one who is over this world. Why don't we do what Psalm 115 calls its readers to do over and over again, to praise him, to give glory to God, to honor his name and his greatness, his grace, his